The last time is the one that gets you because it leads right into the first time. Nowhere to go, but you go on anyway. The more you go on, the more you stop thinking about going on because you're thinking about it all the time. Everything backs up. It gnaws here on the edge, looking back in order not to look forward. I have invented a problem, no mistaking that, now that a problem has occurred. I don't want to smooth out a spot. I notice too much. I should let you notice me. Anything can happen in two nights, Hatchet Jack said. Or one, for that matter. Or none. Hey everybody, thank you for watching Leaf by Leaf. Today, I'm going to be talking about the novels of Rudolf Wurlitzer. These are the novels that are put out by a small press called Two Dollar Radio in Ohio. They are a family-run organization and they're putting out great material. If it weren't for them, we wouldn't have all these novels because they've been in and out of print over the years. The press also does some very playful things such as on the copyright page, which they have their own unique design for, they give you recommended reading locations for each book. So the recommended reading location for Wurlitzer's latest novel, The Drop Edge of Yonder, before heading out on the trail into the unknown, cliffside while staring out at the big empty, while sitting on a bench outside the Trails Inn saloon. And then pretty much anywhere because books are portable and the perfect technology. I couldn't agree more. Rudolf Wurlitzer was recently brought to my attention by a dear friend of mine. He's apparently a, a legend, not my friend. Well, my friend is a legend too, but that's another story. Rudolf Wurlitzer is apparently a legend around the Los Angeles area. He was born in Ohio, but he's been all over the place. But he's more commonly associated with the movie industry. He, as a screenwriter, as a co-director, he even wrote a libretto for Philip Glass. But he has five novels. Four of them I'm going to go over today. It all begins in 1968 with Nog. Nog boasts a blurb by none other than Thomas Pynchon. He says, wow, this is some book. I mean, it's more than a beautiful and heavy trip. It's also very important in an evolutionary way, showing us directions we could be moving in. He concludes it by saying, Rudolf Wurlitzer is really, really good. And I hope he manages to come down again soon, long enough anyhow to guide us on another one like Nog. And you would think that getting blurbed by Thomas Pynchon, of all people, would be a boon. Unfortunately, in my opinion, I think this has hurt the reputation of Rudolf Wurlitzer, especially with his novels, because it seems that many people associated him with the novels of Pynchon. And so they went in with incorrect presumptions. In fact, as I read Nog and then Flats, and then Quake, and then finally The Drop Edge of Yonder, Pinchon never came to mind. Well, maybe in so far as there's a them that comes up once or twice, but it's not a major thing such as it is in Gravity's Rainbow. There is some paranoia as well. There are cartoonish antics that we get, but these aren't annexed by Pinchon alone. In fact, the names that came to my mind when I was reading Nog would be David Markson and his or solipsistic novels and William Burroughs and especially Samuel Beckett, but never Pinchon. So please don't go into Rudolf Wurlitzer with Pinchon as, as a lens or a likeness. His first three novels, Nog, Flats, and Quake, are made to be read in one sitting. In fact, they're most effectively read in one sitting, which is very doable because the longest of the three of them, I think, is 124 pages. Nog reads very quickly. It's quick by design. There are short, simple sentences. It's funny. It's completely saturated with bathos and non sequitur. It begins merely quirky, and then the quirkiness continues to ratchet up until it's just this drug-addled fever dream. We follow very closely our protagonist who has come up or, or contrived three artificial memories that he follows. And this is really interesting because one of the figures that he has created goes by the name of Nog, and that's how he presents himself to people, and that's what people call him and know him as, but presumably that's not his true identity. What we get into here is the suppression of actual data or actual information and the protection of information. 
as something valuable, as, as a, a commodity to be not traded, but to be protective and kept. And this comes out again in Flats. He may be a violent sociopath, or he may just be merely a solipsist. His sense of time is fragmented. His sense of identity is tenuous and merging with his artificial memories. He has loaded his mind with all these lists, lists of rivers, for example, that he utilizes as a means to help suppress real information, real data, sort of like, a, like an encryption scheme or something. As this narrative is flying all over the place and reminiscent of some kind of acid trip, I was reminded of the movie Mother without all the religious symbolism that's in the movie Mother, but the way that it's filmed is very much the way in which we jump around and go headlong through this novel. There's a moment very early on this sentence cracked me up. It won't be funny for you, but if you read just at least the first 25 pages of Nog, this is a winning sentence. It says, there was nothing else to do but grab the basket of ping pong balls and fling them at him. And it's again this sort of non sequitur and bathos where stuff is profound and all these things are happening, but then they just constantly devolve. And it just makes for great fun. You get these really fun sentences like, The house has been a long hysterical inhale, and nothing ever happens when I take four more steps. Nog, his first novel, 1968, blurbed by Pinchon. Don't go into this thinking that it's anything like Pinchon. Think more Beckett and Burroughs and Markson, and just have fun. Two years later, in 1970, he came out with Flats, another 100-page novel, so more of a novella. But with this one, there aren't any chapters. It's one steady stream. It could be in this one that we were getting the same character from Nog. In fact, it could be Nog. It's, it's, very, uh, it's got that solipsism. It's even more in the vein of Samuel Beckett. What it seems is happening is that he's got all these assumed identities for himself. The narrator could be a multiplicity of identities in this book. And it, it's post-apocalyptic. Apparently, you know, the world is there are chemical fires everywhere, and these characters have sort of created a little stronghold in a park. And it seems to me that it's a single setting novel. It stays there in the park the entire time. The narrator is sort of in a fixed location watching all these other characters that are named after the cities from presumably where they have uh, come from to where they're congregating now. We meet Memphis and then Omaha, Halifax, Wichita, Duluth, Houston, Portland, Mobile, Trenton, and so on. We go from one to another. The very first of what could be something like what Pessoa called a heteronym is Memphis. And we'll see how in a single sentence, the perspective alternates between this Memphis and the I that opens the narrative and, and continues to roll out the narrative for the entire thrust of the book, which says, as if I set that up without letting myself in on it. The third person handles the changes, keeps me from getting popped. I don't want to knock the third person. I like to travel there. It avoids stagnation and the theatrics of pointing to myself. So we get all these puzzles and games Wittgenstein is very much in here. The narrator pointedly says, but is that not the case? And I think that hints at Wittgenstein when he says, the world is everything that is the case. At another moment, the narrator says, my language is not connected to an event, a Dixie cup being the only object that holds me together. And in this book, it's really interesting how objects and information are both things to be protected and things that are near and dear to the character as giving him a sense of grounding in the world and a sense of identity. The object here is represented by the Dixie Cup, among other things, and information or data here is represented by the nutritional info on the label of a can of soup. As these games go on with this multiplicity of characters, which may in fact be heteronyms for the narrator, what evolves is a sort of geometry of identity as the clock is winding down in the world around him. Two more years later, 
Quake came out. And in fact, in this $2 radio edition, Quake is packaged with flats. So you just flip it like that, kind of like what New Directions did with the two short stories of uh, Lashlo Crash and Horkai. But Quake is just this, another 100-page novel. It's one steady, unbroken narrative about the aftermath of an earthquake in L.A. There's rioting and looting and conspiracy and drug use and sex going on everywhere. In fact, it kind of reminded me of Murakami novels in that this unnamed narrator is sort of plunged into this chaotic environment, but he stays pretty much uh, level-headed, and then girls throw themselves at him. This one starts to break apart from Nog and Flats and become more of a conventional narrative. It's still got that simple language, but there's more description going on. It's even more cinematic and doesn't plunge you headlong through the whole plot. There's a lot of commentary on media and power structures. There's a, a cynicism that emerges throughout all of the chaos and desperation of the characters in the aftermath of this uh, terrible earthquake. For example, we get a glimpse of two Red Cross ladies with white uniforms and stiff blue hats splashed among them, meaning among the victims, offering coke for a dime and coffee for a nickel. They were picking up a nice piece of change. So these Red Cross ladies are going and, and actually sort of capitalizing on people's suffering and misery. Still, it's got this quirky lens that Wurlitzer brings to these narratives. Very cinematic, very uh, playful, very keen, but also with a story to tell and questions to pose about who we are. His latest book, The Drop Edge of Yonder, was published in 2007 and now reissued by $2 Radio. I love this cover and I love the title, The Drop Edge of Yonder. This is a Western and it gets even more. In fact, I would say that this one is a thoroughly conventional novel. I think that the blurb on the front cover may be a little misleading, such as the, uh, you know, likening of Wurlitzer with Pinchon is misleading. There's a quote from Book Forum, and it says, the most hallucinogenic Western you'll ever catch in the movie house of your mind's eye, which is a great sounding quote. However, it will make you expect something like William Burroughs, like some kind of crazy drug-addled space opera type stream of consciousness cut-ups or something. But it's nothing like that at all. There, Yes, there is uh, some stuff around curses and visions, and it gets into Native American beliefs and things like that. But I think you'll find that for the most part, it reads fairly conventionally. But that's not to say it's not good. In fact, I found it extremely engaging and I couldn't put it down. I don't. I haven't read a lot of westerns. I've read Larry McMurtry, Cormac McCarthy, but you know, like straight genre westerns and spaghetti westerns and stuff like that. I haven't even seen a lot of those types of of movies. But this does show us a more mature Rudolf Wurlitzer, not only writing a more mainstream novel, but getting even more cinematic, rounding out the characters. This novel is about 265 pages long instead of just over 100. We get a protagonist whose name is given to us in the very first sentence instead of remaining unnamed or given uh, heteronyms. The sentences are longer and more descriptive, but still in simple language. The pacing is much slower than its predecessors, but that's not to say slow. This is set in the final days of the fur trade. Uh, California is a new state. The craze over the gold rush is in full effect. And in fact, what makes all these characters so desperate and in many cases so violent is greed. Greed for that gold. This is a huge comment on America in general. It talks about our, America's built on business and especially expansion. We're talking a lot about railroad expansion, getting into the business of transportation, things like that, but always showing that ruthlessness and greed are right butting up against the plight for progress. What makes this one a little bit different is this curse that gets put on Zebulon, our protagonist. He's this wild man, mountain man and outlaw 
who becomes more and more notorious. But he has this curse put on him right at the beginning of the novel. It says, from now on, you will drift like a blind man between the worlds, not knowing if you're dead or alive, or if the unseen world exists, or if you're dreaming. Three times you will disappear to yourself and all that you know, and three times you will and then it cuts off with an M dash. The narrator picks back up. She said something more, but he, Zebulon, was unable to hear the words as she slowly sank beneath the ice. So we get this curse put on him. It gives us our framework for the thrust of the plot, but then we have this puzzle that's put in there. What was she about to say when she said, three times you will disappear to yourself and all that you know, and three times you will... And that's exactly what gives us something more to consider as we read through this narrative. And I can say that the ending is very rewarding. It glances back at those opening pages and some key scenes and kind of reminded me of some stuff that you'll see Christopher Nolan do in his movies. Though don't go into this thinking that it's like that, all the, that it's like one of Nolan's movies all the way through. Just to say there's something at the end or there are a couple things at the end that make you as a reader go, ah, and you just see how clever Rudolf Wurlitzer is. This was apparently originally intended to be a movie, but then was adapted into the novel that we have today. I hope you'll consider checking out some of the work of Rudolf Wurlitzer, and especially these novels from $2 Radio. I thoroughly enjoyed my time reading Wurlitzer.